I'm Marcella Bonvalez, a woman's imager. Uh, for, uh, I have a private practice at, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Also, I have uh, uh, an appointment at the University of Pittsburgh as a clinical assistant professor. I will be talking about pelvic pain in the pre- and postmenopausal women. I'd like to talk about imaging of pelvic pain in the pre- and postmenopausal women. Pelvic pain is one of the most frequent causes of outpatient visits. 25% of all referrals to gynecologists, 40% of all gynecological laparoscopic surgeries, and 12% of hysterectomies are due to pelvic pain. The medical care cost is more than $2 billion per year to treat pelvic pain. Pelvic pain is the most frequently caused by ovarian cysts, endometriosis, and pelvic adhesions. The initial m imaging modality after a good history and physical is pelvic ultrasound. A history, a, uh, a good history should be obtained, uh, the menstruating status, the type of pain, if it's severe, the location of the pain, if it's unilateral versus bilateral, the character of the pain, if it's intermittent, crampy, unconstant, should be uh, documented. The onset of pain, the duration of pain is important. Past history of similar episodes and of previous surgeries is also important information. Uh, associated gastrointestinal and gastrourinary symptoms should be obtained. A good physical exam should be done. Size and consistency and mobility of the uterus and ovaries should be documented. The type of pain during examination. Laboratory assays that may be done in patients who present with pelvic pain are complete blood cell count, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, vaginal swabs for chlamydia and gonorrhea, urinary, urinary analysis with culture, and in the menstruating female, pregnancy tests uh, with a beta human chorionic gonadotropin should be considered. Also, possibly a CA-125. However, the initial imaging study should always be an ultrasound. Acute pelvic pain is abrupt in onset and duration, measured in hours or days, rarely lasts more than a month without a crisis, resolution, or cure. It's due to direct insult of tissue trauma that activates the neural receptors and neural pain fibers. The severity of the pain is directly proportional to the severity of the traumatic insult. It's thought to be a, a, symptom, a symptom, whereas chronic pain is viewed as a disease. Chronic pelvic pain presents in the same location for at least six months. It may lead to years of disability, suffering, many medical procedures. It's associated with depression, and usually the patient is uncooperative and non-compliant. The differential diagnosis for chronic pelvic pain include adhesions, endometriosis, adenomyosis, infections, and neoplasms, which have uncertain relationship to the chronic pain. Chronic pain is probably multifactorial, therefore it is difficult to diagnose and to treat. Laparoscopic, lapar laparoscopy is a valuable tool in patients with chronic pain. Um, it's done, it's performed in less than 50% of women and will it confirm the clinical impression, establish a diagnosis, and it's also useful for therapy for removal of adhesions, aspiration of ovarian cysts, biopsy of intraperitoneal structures avoiding uh, exploratory laparotomy, and also it be, can be very helpful for a follow-up course of the disease. Acute pain can be divided as uh, its origin from gynecologic origin or non-gynecologic origin. Gynecologic causes of acute pelvic pain may be ovarian, such as cysts, functional or hemorrhagic, endometriosis, pelvic inflammatory disease, torsion, neoplasm, malignant or benign, benign including dermoids, cyst adenomas, and fibromas. 
gynecological causes arising from the uterus most commonly are due to fibroids, degenerative or torsion of a fibroid, or from adenomyosis, cervical stenosis, extra ovarian causes of acute pelvic pain include ectopic pregnancy, paraovarian cysts, hydro or pile soppings. Non-gynecological causes of acute pelvic pain may be from gastrointestinal origin such as appendicitis, diverticulitis, or inflammatory bowel disease. Urological causes include acute cystitis, ureteral and urethral calculi. Gynecolo chronic pain can also be due to gynecological and non-gynecologic causes. The most common gynecologic causes of chronic pelvic pain include adenomyosis and endometriosis, adhesions, chronic pelvic pa pain, a chronic pelvic inflammatory disease, pelvic floor myalgia, pelvic congestion, pelvic relaxation, retained ovarian syndrome, and uterine fibroids. The non-gynecologic causes of chronic pelvic pain may be due to abdominal wall factors, gastrointestinal origin, urologic, psychologic, neurogenic, or orthopedic in origin. A large amount of patients will present for pelvic pain a large amount of patients that present for, for, normal, for pelvic pain have a normal ultrasound. The outcome of these patients with pelvic pain in a normal transvaginal ultrasound is a high negative predictive value of 92%. In a study by Harris and his group evaluated 86 women, 77% of the pelvic pain improved or resolved in these women. The majority of these women 86% had acute or subacute pain, and approximately 50% had chronic pain. Only 10% required further imaging. One who had a CT a month later showed that uh, the cause of the pain was due to diverticulitis. 33% underwent 19 surgical procedures. Uh, and that they found in these patients had endometriosis, pelvic varices, and adhesions. Their conclusion was that women with pelvic pain and normal pelvic ultrasound will get better with or without surgical intervention, and further imaging is unlikely to yield positive results. A study by Kunin and his group uh, evaluated laparoscopically findings in patients with pelvic pain. In 1,194 patients evaluated, 355 had normal pelvic and normal pelvis. Another 264 had a pelvic inflammatory disease. The others had either an ovarian pathology, pelvic adhesions, or pelvic congestion. Smaller amounts were due to uterine fibroids, endometriosis, uterine displacement, and ectopic pregnancy. Another study evaluated uh, pelvic pain uh, with, uh, correlated with laparoscopic finding found that 18% of abnormal uh, patients with 18% of patients with abnormal pelvic exam had no abnormality at laparoscopic surgery. 63% patients with a normal pelvic exam had abnormal findings at laparoscopic surgery. The causes, the abnormalities seen in the laparoscopy were ovarian abnormalities, pelvic adhesions, pelvic inflammatory disease, and endometrioma. Their conclusion was that there's not always a correlation between the presence of pelvic pain and abnormality of the pelvic organs. The most common causes of pelvic pain in the, due to urine abnormalities are fibroids, adenomyosis, pelvic inflammatory disease, such as endometriitis, cervical stenosis or cancer causing distension of the uterine cavity. Fibroids or leiomyomas are composed of interleaved bundles of smooth muscles and connective tissue. They're the most common pelvic tumor. They increase in prevalence with age. 20% of women greater than 30 years of, old, 30 years of age will have pelvic pain, will have fibroids. Uh, 
the, it's more common in the black population than in the white population. Fibroids are usually multiple of various size and seen mostly in the body and the fundus of the uterus. This is the indication for 30% of the hysterectomies in the United States. Classifications of fibroids include intramural, submucosa, and subserosa. Intramural are fibroids which are confined within the myometrium. This is a nice drawing on the right from uh, Dr. Netter's book. Submucosa fibroids are those that are projecting into the uterine cavity. And when the whole submucosa fibroid is within the endometrial cavity, it's referred as intracavitary fibroid. Subserosa fibroids are those that are projecting from the peritoneal surface. And when the whole fibroid is projected outside of the uterus with a pedicle, they're considered pedunculated fibroids. Lyomyomas or fibroids clinically present, are, the clinical presentation of fibroids are variable. They depend on the size, the number of tumors, age of patient, proximity of the tumor to the endometrial cavity, mobility, mobility of the fibroid in the presence of degenerative process and infection. Pain is usually due to degeneration, infarction, and infection in the fibroid. Strong uterine contractions, rotation of the fibroids within the pseudocapsule may interfere vessels and result in necrosis. Torsion of pedicles may occur in the subserosal and submucosal fibroids and can cause infarction, degeneration, necrosis, and potential infection. 5 to 10% of the fibers are submucosa. They encroach and distort the endometrium, causing abnormal bleeding. These submucosa fibers are prone to necrosis insufficient due to insufficient blood supply. They're also prone to infection, exposed position, predisposing to ascending infection. And also they're prone to degeneration, which is due to the torsion of the pedicle. All these can cause pain. Intramural fibroids most commonly cause uterine enlargement. They can cause pain when they necrose, degenerate, and less likely uh, get infected. Subserosal fibroids cause pressure on the adjacent pelvic organs or ligaments, causing pain. Lyomyomas are estrogen dependent, usually regress after menopause, and increase in size with pregnancy. In postmenopausal women, if their fibroadenoma, a lyomyoma increases in size, it needs to be removed because of the fear that there may be sarcomatose changes. Lyomyomas uh, present, the sonographic findings of lyomyoma is variable. They may present as a uterine enlargement, mild, they may be mild to moderately echogenic mass, causing nodularity of the contour. They may cause distortion of the endometrial echo or alter echo of the myometrium. They may present as a hypoechoic solid mass with poor posterior transmission or increased echogenicity, and that may be related to the fibers component or if it's associated with posterior acoustic shadowing, it may be due to calcifications within the fibroid. 25% of the fibroids will have calcifications. Some of them may be small. Others may be a rim around the fibroid. A hypo pseudocapsule can occasionally be seen. And occasionally cystic de degeneration seen as irregular anechoic areas may be present. Here is a transvaginal view Satural projection of the uterus. Midline, we see the endometrial cavity, and you see the endometrial mucosa being displaced by this heterogeneous mass which is, has posterior acoustic shadowing. Here is a transverse view of the same on the same patient, and you can see nicely a hypoechoic or heterogeneous mass with shadowing, displacing the endometrial cavity. This is an image, a 3D acquisition, coronal image, showing an intracavitary fibroid. The, you, we can see nicely the endometrial cavity surrounding the fibroid. 
2D uh, coronal view obtained from a 3D acquisition is very helpful in being able to identify the location of uh, these submucosa or intracavity uh, fibroids. Here's another patient, uh, longitudinal view of the uterus, midsection, and we can see longitudinal and transfuse. There's an echogenic mass in the fundus of the uh, uterus, and this is a fibroid that probably has fibrous changes, very echogenic. Here's another case. It's an older case, but it shows how sometimes these fibroids can obliterate visualization of the endometrial cavity. And here you see all these echogenic masses with posterior acoustic shadowing, and which not allow, which prevents us from evaluating the endometrium. Fluid within the endometrium can be very helpful in outlining the endometrium the submucosa fibro. Here on your left, we have a transvaginal study with a small amount of fluid secondary to uh, a sonohistogram that was done. And we see nicely a broad base, hypoechoic mass, which is being um, outlined by this echogenic linear structure, which represents the endometrial lining. This is a submucosa fibroid. MRI can be very helpful in these patients. I, there's probably no need to do an MRI in most of the cases because the diagnosis can be done with uh, transvaginal ultrasound and uh, sonohistogram and the 2D coronal image that we can obtain with 3D acquisition. But in this case, you can see uh, MRI view showing nicely a little fibroid displacing um, the endometrial cavity. And this is a, a nice way also to see the relationship between the fibroid and the endometrial cavity. Here's another MRI, coronal and stat actual view, showing the uh, uterus, actual view of the uterus with the endometrium. And here was a mass, uh, pedunculated fibroid, which this MRI image shows nicely the relationship of the fibroid to the uterus. The management of symptomatic fibro fibroids is various. It can be medical, hysterectomy, a myomectomy, hysteroscopic procedures such as endometrial ablation, especially in sub submucosa fibroids that are causing bleeding, or more recently, uterine artery embolization has been shown to be very helpful in the symptomatic, in patients who have symptomatic fibroids. Uterine artery embolization causes 50 to 60% of these fibroids to reduce in size. It can relieve symptoms in 85 to, 9%, 85 to 95% of patients. It causes shorter hospital days and a rapid recovery time. And here we have another patient on the left is a transabdominal study showing a longitudinal view of the uterus endometrial cavity is being displaced anterior by this heterogeneous uh, hypoechoic, predominantly hypoechoic mass. Transvaginal ultrasound, you can see the mass uh, better, that it's, it is heterogeneous. And this was a fibroid. This was a postmenopausal woman who had a fibroid. She returned six months later because it, the, u, the uterus had increased in size. And as you can see in this picture, that the fibroid has almost doubled in size. Any postmenopausal woman who presents with increasing in size of a fibroid needs to have it surgically removed. And the reason for that is because there's always the potential of uterine sarcoma. Uterine sarcomas arise from the mesenchymal, mesenchymal tissue. Less than 2% of them arise from existing fibroids. 85% have irregular bleeding, and 19% percent with pelvic pain. An enlarging fibro in a postmenopausal woman should be treated with suspicion. Usually the, search, usually the diagnosis is not done preoperative since uh, sonographic findings are very similar to uh, benign fibroids. The extent of the disease in these patients is very important because it determines the prognostic. When it can, the prognosis, when a cancer is confined to the uterus, the five-year survival can be up to 50%. Here's another patient, a transabdominal study showing a 
very difficult to see the uterus, and there was very heterogeneous with echogenic linear structures and shadowing. Here's a CT showing that a lot of this echogenic um, structures, linear structures that were seen on transabdominal ultrasound were actually gas within this mass. And what this was was a necrotic uterine sarcoma. Adenomyosis, another common disease of the uterus that can cause pain. It's more common than what we thought. We see it in 70 to 80 percent of Paris women. 70 percent are symptomatic. Transvaginal ultrasound has pretty high sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy. Sensitivity of 80 to 86 percent, specificity of 50 to 96 percent, and accuracy of 68 to 86 percent. Adenomyosis may present as two types, diffuse or focal. The focal is nodular and sometimes referred as um, adenomyomas. Uh, patients present with, the patients who have adenomyosis present with uterine enlargement, pelvic pain, dysmenorrhea, menorrhagia. Adenomyosis is due to migration of glands from the basal layer of the endometrium into the myometrium. These ectopic glands are seen two to three millimeters below the endomyometrial junction, and they're often misdiagnosed as leiomyomas. The sonographic findings of the diffuse uh, adenomyosis is uterine enlargement with heterogeneous appearance of the myometrium. There is usually an asymmetry between the myometrial walls with the anterior wall being thicker than the posterior wall. Subendometrial tiny cysts or nodules may be seen in 50% of the cases, and this most likely reflects the cyclic functions of the endometrial glands. The focal, uh, the findings, the sonographic findings of the focal uh, adenomyosis is ill-defined echogenic mass, or an adenomyoma. Color and power Doppler ultrasound demonstrate the penetrating vascular pattern within the mass, which helps to differentiate these from the fibroids. Fibroids are well-defined hyperechoic mass with vascularity in the periphery of the mass. And here's a nice example of aden diffused adenomyosis. Uh, transabdominal study, longitudinal view, we see the endometrial cavity, you see that the uterus is markedly enlarged. The anterior myometrial wall is thicker than the posterior myometrial wall. Very heterogeneous myometrium. And within the myometrium, you can see these little cystic areas, which are probably glands. And on color flow, you see how diffuse uh, and how the vascularity enters the mass different than in fibroids in which the vascularity is surrounds, outlines, it's in the periphery of the mass. Another patient, two views showing um, very thick anterior myometrium compared to the posterior myometrium. The endomyometrial junction is not seen here. This is typical of uh, adenomyosis. We know that MRI has a very high sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing adenomyosis. Uh, the diffuse form of ad adenomyosis is seen on MRI as a uterine enlargement with diffuse thickening of the endomyometrial junction. Normally, the endomyometrial junction's width is about 8 millimeters. When it's widened greater than 12 millimeters, it usually represents diffuse adenomyosis. Uh, endomyometrial junction of 8 to 12 millimeters is sometimes associated with focal adenomyosis. Low signal on T2 weighted represents the hypertrophy of the smooth muscle surrounding islands of heterotropic endometrial glands. And here's a nice example of adenomyosis on this MRI. Um, we can see that the, endo, uh, the myometrium is very heterogeneous. The one anterior wall is much thicker than the posterior wall, and the endomyometrial junction is uh, thick, 
you cannot see the anterior part, the anterior part of the endomyometrial junction here. Management for patients who are symptomatic with adenomyosis can be treat, medical treatment, hysterectomy, or also urine artery embolization has shown to improve dysmenorrhea and menorrhagia in these women. Another common, another cause of pain in women is pelvic inflammatory disease. And endometriitis in the uterus can be seen or identified, and it's usually associated in patients who already have pelvic inflammatory disease or after a DNC. Sonographic findings in the endometrium include increased echogenicity, as you can see here in this transvaginal study shown in thickened endometrium. Uh, or sometimes, occasionally, we can see uh, acoustic enhancement. Occasionally, we can see fluid. And the presence of gas can be seen in 21% of the patients and confirms the diagnosis. Here you see two different patients with complex fluid collections. Uh, these two patients have endometriitis. On, one, on this patient, the complex fluid collection can mimic a pseudoestational sac, which can be seen in ectopic pregnancies. Another patient, transabdominal study, shows a longitudinal view of the uterus, a complex endometrial fluid collection. Within the fluid connection, we see this linear echogenic structure. Transvaginal better delineates the endometrium. We see nicely the mucosa of the endometrium, echogenic complex fluid collection within the endometrium, and this curvilinear echogenic structure with shadowing consistent with gas. This confirms that this is endometriitis. Pain can also be due to cervical stenosis, and cervical st uh, stenosis may be due to chronic cervical infection. Treatment of endocervicitis or surgery to the cervix can cause cervical stenosis. Um, the di definition of cervical stenosis is the inability to pass a 2.5 millimeter or less probe into the canal. Uh, th this causes cervical stenosis causes distension of the uterine cavity, hemat hematometra, hydometra, pyometra, and all these may cause cramps, spasmodic, suprapubic pain. In the premenopausal woman, it may be the pain may also be associated with oligomenorrhea, amenorrhea, and dysmenorrhea. Um, cervical dilatation is usually the treatment that is done and can be done with ultrasound guidance. In postmenopausal woman, endometrial fluid collection may be due to carcinoma, endometrial or cervical, endometrial polyps. Uh, status post radiation therapy, but the most common cause of endometrial fluid collection in the postmenopausal woman is probably exogenous estrogen administration due to uh, some degree of cervical stenosis. Here's a, a postmenopausal woman, transvaginal ultrasound shows uh, marked distension of the uterine cavity by fluid due to cervical stenosis. In a uh, hematometra, or maybe due in a postmenopausal woman, to reactivation of endometriosis. These women are usually taking hormone replacement therapy, and as you can see here on this uh, transvaginal study, uh, dilated, distended endometrial cavity with homogeneous fluid, which was blood. And here again, you can see distension of the cervical canal with fluid, and these were two patients who had cervical stenosis um, secondary to, um, because they were postmenopausal. Cervical cancer can also cause pain, can cause cervical, cervical cancer can also cause uh, uterine endometrial cavity distension and pain. However, ultrasound is not, ultrasound is not very helpful in the diagnosis of cervical disease. Uh, however, cervical cancer has decreased in the past decades because of the widespread screening with a Papanicola test. MRI actually has had the most impact on preoperative staging of cervical cancer. Most common uh, cause of cervical cancer is squamous cell, um, and usually uh, cervical cancer spreads locally and through lymphatic invasion. 
Here's a, a transvaginal study, retroverted uterus, sagittal view. We can see the endometrium nicely, the fundus of the uterus. And in the cervical area, we see this irregular, marginated, heterogeneous mass. And here again, we see that the mass had a lot of vascularity. L on this longitudinal view, we see nicely the cervical canal, but it almost on, can be seen that there is invasion into the mucosa, and this was a large cervical cancer. Causes of uh, uh, pelvic pain due to ovarian origin depends if the patient is on the premenopausal woman. It's most likely due to functional cysts or hemorrhagic cysts, can be due to endometriosis pelvic inflammatory disease, torsion, or tumor, most commonly benign, such as dermoid, can be malignant. In postmenopausal women, the most common cause of pain from an ovarian origin is cysts or tumor. And the most common tumor, benign tumor, would be a fibroma, or, um, or and another common cause of ovarian tumors are malignant tumors. Functional cysts in premenopause, seen in premenopausal women. These include follicular, corpus luteum, and theca luteum cysts. The follicular cysts occurs when a mature follicle fails to ovulate or involute, involute and should not be diagnosed until it's greater than 2.5 centimeters. The corpus luteum cysts results from failure of absorption or excess bleeding into the corpus luteum. The, the theca luteal cysts are the largest, and they're associated with high levels of uh, human chorionic gonadotropin. These are associated with gestational hesta trophoblastic disease. Probably the most common cause of pelvic pain in the premenopausal woman is a hemorrhagic cyst. This is internal hemorrhage into functional cysts. These patients present with acute pelvic pain, and they actually probably can tell you exactly when the pain occurred. Sonographically, the, the findings depend on the amount and the time of hemorrhage relative, relative to the ultrasound done. In acute hemorrhage, usually the hemorrhagic cyst will present as a hyperechoic, mimicking a, ma a solid mass. The, the, board, the posterior wall will be smooth, and many times it will have posterior acoustic enhancement. As the clot hemolysis, the Hemor the hemorrhagic cyst becomes more complex and a reticular pattern develops, which contains tiny little septations. No flow will be seen within the mass. Occasionally, you'll see free fluid, and that's due to leakage or rupture of the hemorrhagic cyst. And this is typical findings of hemorrhagic cysts. On the left, you can see a hemorrhagic cyst, don't, very homogeneous. Uh, we don't see very well the ovarian tissue surrounding it because it's so large. And here's another patient on your right which has that typical reticular pattern. When you see this reticular pattern, it can be nothing else but a hemorrhagic cyst. Postmenopausal women can also present with cysts. They're seen in 17% of all asymptomatic women. 90% uh, or less than three centimeters. The, the, the important thing here is 53% of these cysts will disappear totally, totally with time. The rest will either decrease or increase in size, but there's really no relationship between these cysts, age, weight of the patient, parity, or hormone use, or the length of time for menopause. Uh, what do you do with these cysts in postmenopausal females? Well, they're pretty, they're prevalent. Uh, they're usually uh, seen in five to eight percent in one study, and um, they're, they're usually measured between 20 to 50 millimeters. But in the literature, it has been shown that the risk for malignancy is less than 1%. The only time that it's worrisome is if you do see within the cyst small mural nodules. If no, small, small, if no small mural nodules are seen, seen then you can follow this, following, this management. If they're one to three centimeters, they do not need any follow-up. You may want to do a CA-125 level. If they're between three to five centimeters, you may follow them. Nobody knows exactly when you should do a follow-up ultrasound, probably in a year. You may also want to do a CA-125 level in these patients. 
if they're between 5 and 10 centimeters in diameter, they're usually still benign. They may be uh, associated with a low malignant neoplasm. You may want to consider laparoscopic removal if the patient is clinically stable. Endometriosis, another very common cause of pelvic pain in the premenopausal women. Endometriosis is functional endometrial tissue outside the uterine musculature, implanted on the surface of other organs and responds to the hormonal stimuli. It's most frequently seen in the ovary, uterine ligament, may be seen in the pouch of Douglas, pelvic peritoneum, fallopian tubes, less frequently in the bladder, cervix, or vagina, but can also be seen in abdominal scars C after C-section. Endometriosis occurs in women in the reproductive years, between 25 years and 29 years. 7 to 10 percent of the population uh, has endometriosis, and it is the cause of 20 to 50 percent of infertile, infertility in women. Tenfold increased risk of women with first degree relatives. And the symptoms, the most common symptoms, are pain and dysmenorrhea dyspareunia, abnormal menstrual bleeding, and infertility. Pain is not correlated with the extent of the disease, and imaging is very limited in these patients. Here's a nice case of endometriosis, which is usually bilateral. This is a transverse view, transabdominal, the uterus, and two bilateral hypoechoic masses. On transvaginal ultrasound, you can see better the morphology or the echogenicity of these masses. This was very hypoechoic, homogeneous, looks look very similar to the hemorrhagic cyst I showed you prior. Transvaginal ultrasound has a high sensitivity and specificity for diagnosis endometriosis, and the reason is identification of an endometrioma, which is a, occasionally referred to as a chocolate cyst, um, may, may be seen. The class, uh, the ultrasound findings of an endometrioma are nonspecific. The mass may be cystic with diffuse low-level echoes, as I showed you prior, as seen in this image. Um, it may be multilocular with thin septations and irregular war walls. It may be, looks just like a hemorrhagic cyst. cyst. Uh, however, hemorrhagic cysts usually have that reticular pattern free fluid, and decrease in size over time. These may not change at all in time, and usually you will not see that uh, classical reticular pattern. MRI can be used to diagnose endometriosis. And when would you use MRI? Well, when, when the ultrasound findings are equivocal, or for diagnosis of superficial peritoneal implants, extraperitoneal lesions, lesions in the rectovaginal space, urosacral ligaments. On MRI, an endometrioma has a high signal T1 weighted, and it loses the signal on T2 weighted, referred as the shading sign. It, and this is due to the high protein and iron concentration from recurrent hemorrhage. The sensitivity of MRI in diagnosing endometriosis is 90 to 92%, with a specificity of 91 to 98%. Well, what do you do with women, premenopausal women, with ovarian cystic lesions? Simple or minimally complicated cysts under five, mil, after, uh, under five centimeters are usually physiologic and may need no follow-up. Hemorrhage without vascular soft tissue component is usually a reliable indicator of benign lesion. However, if there's any question about the imaging feature, features, uh, you can recommend a follow-up ultrasound one or two menstrual cycles, in one or two menstrual cycles. Usually, you want to do it in the early proliferative phase of the cycle. And if that doesn't help, you can always do a CT or MRI, especially in cases that you are questioning dermoid cysts. What are the diagnostic goals for ovarian masses? It's important to discriminate between lesions that need to be further evaluated with imaging, a follow-up, have surgery, and those that do not. Determine if the MRI, CT exam, or a follow-up ultrasound should be done for management 
decisions. If you do think that it's suspicious for a malignancy, then you may want to refer the patient to a gynecological oncologist. It's important to be able to determine if the mass that you're seeing is ovarian or extra ovarian. Look for a rim of ovarian parenchyma, little follicle surrounding the mass, to establish an intra-ovarian origin. Identify a separate epsilateral ovary from the mass to establish that it's extra ovarian in origin. While scanning, observe movement of the mass with respect to the ovary during manual compression or with a transducer. Here is a ovarian cystic mass and we see in the periphery a few little follicles to confirm that it's within the ovary. And nicely you can see here high resistant waveform in this proliferative phase. Two other, uh, another case of ovarian cyst and you can see nicely that this uh, the cyst is surrounded by ovarian tissue, longitudinal transverse, you can see nicely the ovarian tissue, and you see in the periphery it's a low resistant waveform probably uh, due to the luteal phase of the cycle. And premenopausal women who present with large ovarian cysts, I mean greater than five centimeters, we perform transvaginal gritted, transvaginal cyst aspiration. We use a transvaginal probe with a guide and insert a 20 gauge, 20 centimeter needle through the vaginal vault into the cyst, aspirating the fluid. Patients usually get immediate relief from the pain. The procedure is not painful. Uh, occasionally, I will place a little lidocaine in the vaginal vault, but uh, if there's no inflammation, there's probably no need for lidocaine. Another cause of, uh, of pain due to, in, due to ovarian origin is pelvic inflammatory disease. The, usually these ovaries are enlarged. They have decreased cortical med medullary differentiation. The masses, when they do present as a mass, which are seen in 38.9% of the cases, they're usually nonspecific. Masses are probably most likely due to tube ovarian abscess, and these can be cystic, complex, or solid. Sometimes these masses represent adhesions of the ovaries to the omentum, and occasionally identification of gas can be seen and confirms the diagnosis. Here's a, a beautiful netter diagram showing um, fallopian tube and infection going into the ovary. Actually, the ovary is pretty resistant to infection, and uh, first sign you will see is endometriitis, then you will see, since it's an ascending uh, infection, the infection starts from the cervix up the endometrium into the fallopian tubes, and usually the ovaries are the last to be affected, and they're pretty resistant, as you can see here. But after continuous spillage of purulent fluid into the perio-ovarian region, the ovary does get infected. And you can see nicely on this um, transvaginal study, which correlates nicely with the netter diagram, the dilated fallopian tube with uh, complex or heterogeneous fluid within it and penetrating into the ovary, infecting the ovary. Um, this, in this case, we refer this to an tubal ovarian complex and not quite a tubal ovarian abscess instead of a two ovarian abscess, which we see in this case. In this case, transabdominal on your left and transvaginal on the right, we see posterior to the uterus, a complex mass. Seen better on the trans, delineated much better on this transvaginal study, we see uh, a, a solid material within the mass. And this was a two ovarian abscess, which can be drained. And here's another patient, bilateral disease, which is common in uh, pelvic inflammatory disease. This is a transabdominal transverse views of the uterus and shows bilateral adenexal masses. Transvaginal ultrasound on your right shows that the masses are very complex, multiloculated. In this case, there was uh, nothing to actually um, drain. This patient was treated with antibiotic treatment and after antibiotic 
therapy, she returned and her ovaries had resumed the normal size in um, morphology. Uh, two ovarian abscess. Uh, when two ovarian abscess are refractory to medical management, that means antibiotic treatment, they can be drained with ultrasound guidance, either using transabdominal, transvaginal, or transrectal approach. The approach really depends on the location of the abscess. An abscess high in the pelvis or anterior to the uterus, you may want to do a transabdominal approach. In those abscesses in the cul-de-sac, you may want to do a transvaginal or transrectal approach. Ultra, ultra, ultrasound guided aspiration is very effective and safe and avoids laparoscopic and laparotomy. Transvaginal guided technique eliminates the risk of general anesthesia, surgical mobility, morbidity, and abdominal wall complications. It also avoids uh, the loops of bowel, urinary bladder, uterus, neural uh, vascular structure, therefore makes this procedure much more desirable. Systemic antibiotics should be administrated uh, when this procedure is done. Occasionally, if you get non-purulent collection, you may just want to do an aspiration without placement of the catheter. If you do obtain purulent fluid when you do uh, uh, when you do aspirate these uh, fluid collections, you may want to place a catheter for at least three days, irrigating it every, every day with saline. The uh, curative uh, rate is about 78%, even in these patients with purulent fluid. And here's a case, a patient presented with a complex, a large complex mass, and we uh, drained it using transvaginal guided, transvaginal aspiration. And as you can see here on the right, we didn't completely, and usually you don't completely drain it completely, but enough that you can start treating the patient with antibiotics. Here's another patient. It, this was a difficult case. It was difficult to see this abscess. We actually had seen it on CT, and then when we did the transvaginal ultrasound, this correlated with what we had seen on CT. And these echogenic areas within this solid looking mass was gas. And you can see here the needle coming in and draining this purulent fluid collection. Postmenopausal women can also get tubal ovarian abscess. It's a rare condition. It's only seen in 1.7% of all the tubal ovarian abscess. Usually these women uh, require surgery uh, and, the, and the diagnosis is not made uh, preoperatively. And the cause of this is recurrent pelvic inflammatory disease. The agent, responsible agent, is usually E. coli or Klebsiella. Uh, these patients require prolonged hospitalization and do get uh, complications. So it's important in the postmenopausal woman, if you suspect a tubal ovarian abscess, to do early and radical surgery. Another cause of pelvic pain in predominantly in the premenopausal woman, is ovarian tumors. The most common ovarian tumor in the premenopausal woman is the cystic teratoma or dermoid cyst. It consists of 15 to 25 percent of all the ovarian neoplasm. 10 to 50 percent are bilateral. They're composed of well-differentiated derivatives of the three germ cell layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. In the reproductive age group, Usually the patient's asymptomatic, and it's seen doing a, a, a ultrasound or sometimes it's clinically palpated. Complications include torsion, rupture. Malignant transformation is very uncommon, seen in less than 2% of the patients. The sonographic appearance of a cystic teratoma or dermoisins are very variable. They can be from anechoic to hyperechoic. There's been a few uh, classifications or uh, of uh, sonogra sonographic uh, pathomimonic signs of dermoid. One is the dermoid plaque, which is a cystic mass with an echogenic shadowing mural nodule. The mural nodule is due to hair, teeth, or fat. The cystic component is sebum, which is liquid at body temperature. Another pathomimonic sonographic fine sign is tip of the iceberg.
It's a very highly echogenic uh, mass, and the, the increased echogenicity is due to a mixture of hair and sebum and multiple tissue interfaces, and this produces ill-defined shadowing, obliterating uh, posterior, uh, obliterating visualization of the posterior wall, the mass. A dermoid mesh is another classical pathomimonic sonographic presentation of a dermoid, and these are multiple linear echogenic interfaces floating within a cyst. Also, fat fluid or hair fluid levels can be seen. Pitfalls are that many times dermoids can mimic bowel gas, acute hemorrhagic cysts and endometriomas, and therefore you may need another imaging modality to confirm the diagnosis. Here's a nice case of the tip of the iceberg sign. We see that there's a mass, echogenic mass with shadowing, and it's within an ovary. You see that surrounding this mass is little follicles, demonstrating that this is an ovarian mass. And um, another view, tip of the iceberg, very echogenic mass and shadowing. Another dermoid, here is a longitudinal view of the uterus, transabdominal study, and in this lower uterine segment, you could see to one uh, side, to the right, that there's an ill-defined echogenic mass, difficult to uh, outline well, Here's uh, the mass better seen on, um, on the, in the right at an exa. And transverse views, you can see the mass here and here. Uh, occasionally, when it can be missed or, uh, or missed, um, diagnosed as a loop of bowel. Another patient with a dermoid cyst, and here you can see this is a dermoid plaque a cystic mass with a mural nodule that's very echogenic and shadowing. Very, sometimes very tough to differentiate this from the adjacent loops of bowel. Another a dermoid, complex cystic mass, complex echogenic areas, shadowing. This is due to sebum, the fluid, typical of a dermoid, fat within a mass. Flu Fat fluid levels. Here's another one showing the typical fat fluid levels. Nicely seen on this transvaginal study. As you wrote, turn the patient, the fluid changes position. Here within the mass, you see these little echogenic nodules, typical of a dermoid. Occasionally, you may need to do CT or MRI to confirm the diagnosis. And here, nicely on T1 and T2, shows the typical MRI findings of a dermoid identification of fat. Diagnosis of dermoids is usually made by ultrasound, but if there's any questions, a CT or MRI can be helpful to confirm the presence of fat. If these dermoids are large, they may have laparoscopic surgery. Tiny dermoids are usually just followed with ultrasound because surgery can probably cause more damage to the ovary than the dermoid itself. Another tumor that can be seen in the ovary, can cause pain, is a cystadenoma. These are benign tumors. They're usually unilocular. They may have septations, and they may even have solid components and complex fluid, and can be sometimes mistaken for um, malignant tumors. And here on the right, you can see cystic mass with septations, typical of a cystadenoma in a postmenopausal woman. Ovarian fibromas are benign ovarian tumors. Their size can range from microscopic to very large. They're usually hard, flat, flat shocky white surface, surfaces that have walled appearance. They may have calcifications and they may be bilateral. Uh, the absence of fat helps them differentiate them from the other solid tumors, which are called thacomas. They're very similar sonographically to uterine fibroids because they have variable attenuation. They usually present with high, as a hypoechoic mass with attenuate posterior acoustic shadowing. And here's a nice case of a fibroma. Uh, this is a transvaginal study. Transverse view of the uterus. Endometrium is seen here. And separate from the uterus is a solid mass. And the mass could be separated 
or shown that it's separate from the mass by pushing with a transvaginal probe between the mass and the mass and the uterus, showing that there's definite a separation between both of them. This was uh, an ovarian fibroma. He was another patient, a different patient, transabdominal study, presented with acute pain. And this is a transabdominal view, satural projection, showing a mass posterior to the uterus. Transvaginal shows that the mass had no flow. And here an MRI was done, and uh, this was torsion of a fibroma. And here is the pathologic specimen. Ovarian torsion, that's due to partial or complete rotation of the ovarian pedicle, resulting in compromised blood supply. It's usually seen in premenopausal women and usually associated with a cyst or a benign tumor such as a dermoid. Uh, the reason it's not usually associated with malignant tumors is because malignant tumors usually have, are uh, invading or have a reaction to the adjacent tissue and therefore preventing from torsion to occur. Predisposing factors for ovarian torsion include hypermobile, elongated tube, or a mesosalpings, tube spasm, or exercise. Adenexo torsion is, can, is either with just the, includes only the ovary, the tube, or both. 67% of uh, ovarian adenexo torsion includes both the ovary and the tube. It's the fifth most common gynecological or surgical emergency, and usually the patient presents with severe pain, intense, localized, it occasionally may, may be intermittent, and in those, it's usually due to partial rotation. These patients also present with anorexia, nausea, and vomiting. The sonographic finding ultrasound is usually the initial study in patients who present with uh, ovarian torsion. It is important to correctly identify the absence of torsion be, to allow conservative treatment. It is also very important to make the diagnosis as soon as possible so that the right surgery can be done. Early diagnosis is crucial and um, now in, uh, what is uh, accustomed to do in premenopausal women is to do untwist the vascular pedicle despite necrotic appearance of the ovary at surgery and, two, and four to six weeks later return to surgery after the hemorrhage and edema has resolved. In postmenopausal women, who don't usually, who are less likely to get ovarian torsion, usually uh, the uh, treatment is oophorectomy. The sonographic findings of ovarian torsion include a large ovary, a large ovary, I mean, 23 to 44 cubic centimeters. Uh, the, the ovary can be echogenic with multiple uh, small cystic areas aligning in the periphery. Right ovary is more likely to be involved because they feel that the sigmoid on the left protects the left ovary. Uh, you may see a coexisting cystic solid or complex mass in 73% of the cases. It's less commonly seen in patients who have pelvic inflammatory disease, endometriosis, or malignant neoplasm. And this is due to the, these case, in these cases, it's felt that these patients have adhesions, therefore renders the ovaries immobile to torsion. The uh, identifications of absence of flow can help make the diagnosis. Occasionally, we'll see free fluid and identification of the twisted vascular pedicle can be uh, very helpful. Comparing with a contralateral side is crucial in making this diagnosis. Even though that identification of absent flow in the ovary can help you make the diagnosis, that's only seen in less than 50% of the cases. And the reason is that the ovary has dual supply dual arterial supply. So you may see flow within the ovary and still have ovarian torsion. As you can see in this study that was done, um, absent arterial and venous flow was seen in 40% of the patients, but 
you could see normal arterial and venous flow in 7% of the patients. So there's a whole variety of uh, flow patterns that can be seen in the presence of adenex or torsion. But even though that colorful Doppler is highly variable in patients with uh, torsion, uh, the absence of arterial blood flow is still seen in a significant percent of patients. Normal flow is seen in 60% of patients, where, and that's due to the dual arterial supply, and probably that due to venous thrombosis be occurs before arterial obstruction. Absence of reversal diastolic flow has been described in these patients. Most frequently, what we will see is either decrease or absence of venous flow first, and this is felt to represent a, a collapse of the venous walls, which probably occurs before arterial compromise. A color flow Doppler in ovarian torsion, uh, the presence of flow does not allow exclusion of torsion, suggests that the ovary may be viable, especially the flow is seen centrally. Absence of flow in a twisted vascular pedicle may indicate that a not viable ovary. CT may even help when ultrasound findings are ambiguous by showing nonspecific lack of enhancement midline mass in a midline mass and possibly gas within the mass. Deviation of the uterus to the side of the affected ovary is frequently seen associated with ascites, thickened fallopian tube, and obliteration of the planes. And here is a case of an ovarian torsion on the left, a normal ovary showing flow within the ovary. On the right, markedly enlarged ovary, echogenic center, and you can see in the periphery multiple cystic areas in this uh, torsed ovary. Very important to compare one side from the other. Ovarian cancer is the most uh, frequent cause of death from gynecological malignancy in the United States. 20,700 new cases per year are seen with ovarian cancers. 16,000 women will die with this disease this year. One in 17 women will develop ovarian cancer, which is less frequent than in breast cancer, which is one in eight. The problem is that usually by the time the patient presents, the tumor is advanced. The, the symptoms become apparent when the tumor compresses or invades the adjacent structures, ascites develops, or there's metastasis. 70% of these women will present with advanced disease, and therefore the five-year survival rates in these women is 15 to 20%, compared to stage one, which is up to 90%. And here you can see on your left a transvaginal study showing a large complex mass, solid and cystic components, Doppler shows low resistant waveform, increased diastolic flow in this postmenopausal woman with an adenexal mass. Postmenopausal women should not have a low resistant wave, increased diastolic flow in an, any adenexal mass. Another patient and this is to show that morphology is the most important thing. This woman presented with a complex adenexal mass, postmenopausal woman, had a, the mass had a solid component that had flow, but the flow within it was a high resistant flow. But the morphology is more important than the waveform. This was cancer until proven otherwise, and it was an ovarian carcinoma. Metastasis to the ovaries can also present, and it's seen in 10 to 30% of ovarian malignancy. Most are postmenopausal females. Most common is, aden is from uh, adenocarcinoma of the endometrium. But metastasis can also come from the breast, gastrointestinal tract. 30 to 40% percent present with bilateral adenexal masses. And metastasis can also be due to lymphoma or le leukemia. leukemia. And here's an, a case of an enlarged ovary with, in a postmenopausal woman, 
no mass was seen, just the ovary was enlarged and had low resistant waveform with increased diastolic flow. This is abnormal. This was metastasis due to an eno uh, adenocarcinoma of the endometrium. Echogenic free fluid in a premenopausal woman may be due to ruptured hemorrhagic cysts, pelvic inflammatory disease, or ectopic pregnancy. However, in the postmenopausal woman, when you see echogenic free fluid, you have to worry about malignancy, even though you may not see the, uh, the primary. Pelvic pain can also be due to non-gynecological abnormalities, and these can arise from the bladder, urethra, ure ureter, bowel, or adenexa. In the bladder, pain, a patient can present with pain due to cystitis or infection. A cystitis can be due to infectious cystitis, interstitial, or radiation cystitis. These women can present with severe pelvic pain. The predisposing uh, factors of infectious cystitis are various. And here are two different patients with cystitis. On your left, you can see a distended bladder with echogenic material and some echogenic foci representing gas. This was infected fluid within the endometrium, within the bladder. On your right, another patient, which shows a thickened bladder wall, diffusely thickened bladder wall, cystic areas within the bladder wall. This was due to radiation cystitis. Bladder diverticuli can also cause pain, and that's due to they they can cause the, they can have urinary stasis, which goes to become infected and become painful. Usually, what you see an ultrasound are round, well defined, fluid filled masses, which can vary in size and disappear when the patient voids. In this case, on your right, a magnified view shows nicely the pedicle between the um, the diverticuli and the bladder wall. Bladder tumors, which are more common in men than women, but women can present with bladder tumors, can present also with uh, pain. And here's a case, a trans, um, vaginal stu transabdominal study on your top left shows a polypoid mass protruding into the bladder. And on transvaginal, you see the, the wall even better, the mass outlined by the bladder the urine. And here on color flow, lots of flow seen centrally and low resistant waveform on color flow. And this was a bladder tumor in a postmenopausal woman who presented with bleeding. And a premenopausal woman, this is not, not, the images are not very nice, but I love this case. And this is a bladder, transabdominal bladder. And we saw that in the base of the bladder, there was this mass, the very smooth mass protruding into the uh, bladder. And this was endometriosis in a premenopausal woman. Another, pre another patient with endometriosis that I had recently and we follow, this is the bladder, the wall is thin, it should be two millimeters, and then all of a sudden you see focal thickening in the wall of the bladder. The wall, this is a transvaginal study too, wall of the bladder. And this was endometriosis. Another patient, bladder in these two echogenic, curvilinear echogenic structure was shadowing within the bladder. Here's the uterus and here's the bladder. Transvaginal studies show these curvilinear echogenic. These were bladder calculi patient presented with pain. Uh, patients can present with abnormalities in the urethra that can cause pain. And they can be due to calculi, cysts, diverticuli, or stenosis. Also, Calculi in the ureter can cause pain. So it's very important when you finish a transvaginal ultrasound and you're pulling out the transvaginal probe to look at the urethra. Many times we will find uh, the cause for the patient's symptoms. Here we can see this was a transperineal study and you see the curved line shows you the vagina. Anterior to the vagina, you see the bladder and the urethra. Within the urethra, there's a curvilinear structure, and this was a calculi within the urethra. Another patient, transperineal study, 
This is the vagina, this is the urethra, a cyst within the urethra. Bladder is here, anterior. Urethra diverticuli result from abscess formation in the periurethral ducts, which can become congested, obstructed, infected, and can also cause pain. And here's a patient in the urethra, the wall of the urethra, she had the cystic structure with increased flow. You see low, lots of flow within this, the surrounding, uh, the periphery of the cystic structure. And this was also uh, an urethra diverticuli that was infected. The transabdominal study shows a little echogenic structure right next to the wall with shadowing. We did transvaginal, and we saw a dilated urethral, and the calcifications or calculi were able to be identified. A different patient, transvaginal ultrasound showed a dilated ureter, and then in the distal ureter, the wall was very thick, and increased flow was seen within the wall of the distal ureter. You could see lots of flow. Um, we did not see a stone in this case. This patient was treated with uh, antibiotics and came back 10 days later and the distal ureter was back to normal size. Uh, we feel that maybe she passed a stone and this was inflammation of the distal ureter due to the recent passage of a calculus. Abnormalities in the bowel can also present as pe with pelvic pain. Masses in the bowel, for example, carcinoma, polyps, abscesses, diverticular appendiceal abscesses, dilated loops of bowel due to obstruction, or wall thickening of the bowel due to inflammatory or metastatic disease. Here on your left, normal distended loops of bowel. On your right, thickened wall of this loop of bowel secondary to ulcerative colitis. This was picked up on a transvaginal ultrasound. Another case picked up on ultrasound was distended loops of bowel. When we did a transvaginal study, we saw that there was a mass in the pelvis. We inserted water into the rectum, and we saw that the water delineated the mass, which was within the wall of the sigmoid. This was a sigmoid tumor, which was diagnosed on the transvaginal study, but because we had seen distended loops of bowel. This is in the right lower quadrant. It's hard to see, but uh, you see a tubular structure, thickened wall, and then you see, you see a, next to it a, a round mass, uh, heterogeneous in appearance, and this is the appendiceal abscess right where the patient was having pain, right lower quadrant. These are two transvaginal studies, longitudinal and transverse. Another patient with an appendic appendicolith and you can see here the appendix wall is very thickened, and it, within the uh, pentacolith, you can see this. It's seen the pentacolith is seen as an echogenic foci, and here thickened wall and a, an abscess adjacent to it. This are two transvaginal studies. Another patient presented with pelvic pain, huge, large, complex mass, echogenic fluid surrounding it. This was a large rupture appendiceal abscess. Two other patients. Uh, this is another patient. You can see thickened wall. This was in the low, left lower quadrant, very thick bowel. The, the wall of the bowel is very thickened. And then you see this big heterogeneous mass uh, adjacent to one of the walls. This was a diverticular abscess. Another patient, sort of ill-defined mass in the left lower quadrant. You see these echogenic structures within it. This is gas and this was a diverticular abscess, which unless you look for it carefully, it could be easily missed. You can see that the wall is diffusely thickened of this loop of bowel, and this was metastatic disease to the uh, loop of bowel. This is another patient presented with, uh, you see a loop of bowel, it looks normal until all of a sudden you come to one point, there's some thickening focal thickening of this loop of bowel. This is in longitudinal, and this is the transverse view of the loop of bowel, a hypoechoic mass seen into your wall. When you ask the patient, she gives you a history that she recently had a polypectomy. So this most likely, we thought, was a hematoma secondary to the recent polypectomy.
The patient was brought back uh, a couple weeks later, and this was no longer visualized. Pelvic varices, which are dilated, incompetent ovarian veins, may also, call pel may also cause pelvic pain, and it's not sure why. It's thought that it may be due to venous stasis, which produces congestion and pain. Treatment for pelvic congestion syndrome include hormonal ovarian suppression, psychotherapy, oophorectomy, ligation of ovarian veins, and embolization of ovarian veins. And here we can see a trans vaginal study showing the uterus and this tubular structure. This is a normal vessel seen in the adenexa. These are abnormal vessels. These are varices. You can see a t the uterus adjacent to the uterus. There's all these cystic structures. When you put flow, they're all vessels. These are veins, dilated veins. They're abnormal and they're pelvic uh, uh, varices, which can also cause pain. Another patient presented with pelvic pain, and when we did color, we saw that this iliac vessel had a clot in it. This patient also had an adenexal mass, and she had pelvic thrombophlebitis. Another patient with pelvic pain had uh, a thrombus within the pelvic vein, and she had also uh, deep vein thrombosis of her lower extremity, which extended into the uh, pelvic veins. Also, pain can be due to abnormalities in the lymph nodes in the pelvis, either due to inflammation, metastatic disease, or lymphoma, as you can see in this case, an enlarged pelvic lymph node, secondary to lymphoma. Also, pelvic pain can be due to um, structures such as a pelvic kidney. Here, this patient did not know she had a pelvic kidney on this transvaginal study. Another patient had a transplanted kidney, which was hydronephrotic, causing pain. In conclusion, evaluation of pelvic pain should be initiated with a pelvic ultrasound, transabdominal and transvaginal, to exclude gynecological and certain non-gynecological pathology. Most women with a normal pelvic ultrasound will improve with or without surgical intervention, and further imaging is unlikely to yield positive results. However, if the ultrasound is limited, MRI or CT of the pelvis may be helpful.